Good morning, folks. Welcome to Coffee with Artists. My name is Rachel Wilkins. Delighted to be here. Happy Friday, everybody. Go grab a good cup of coffee. This is my first one of the day, so I am ready. And we have a great guest with us this morning. Annie Bao is a painter. Uh, she's uh, showed with us several times in New York City. And Annie, it's great to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. Absolutely. And I've got my huge you know tumbler of coffee. What are you drinking? What's in your cup this morning? Um, so it's just iced coffee with lots nice. of milk. Nice. I'm like yeah. black coffee all the way, even when it's you know the, the height of the summer in July. I, I just can't do that iced coffee. It just feels yeah. Good. <laughs> I just think of this as like my protein shake because you know, it has milk. Yeah. <laughs> Well, good morning to everybody joining us. Um, Annie is going to be here for the next 45 minutes or so, and we will be taking questions at the end of the session. So if you have any questions that come up, do go ahead and add them into the comments, and we'll get to you towards the end of the show. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time, please go ahead and hit subscribe uh, on YouTube uh, or give us a follow on Facebook. So Annie, just before we were we were chatting, just before we jumped on, and I was asking a little bit about um, where you grew up, and you have a very layered answer to that question. So, what, <laughs> tell us a little bit about uh, growing up, and you know, your your kind of moves to to variety of different places. <clears throat> um, so, I was born in Beijing, China, uh, and I went to school there until I was eleven. Actually, I went to a conservatory for music. Um, for piano, um, which I continue to play in competitively until college. And then my family went to California and then uh, came to New York for school and just stayed. And right before COVID, we just moved to Stanford, Connecticut. And it was like, <sighs> yeah, we were talking as we did. Right. We were just, we were talking about the, the, when you've lived in New York City or when you live in New York City for any period of time, you feel like it's the center of the earth, right? It's like there's yeah. no once you've lived in New York, you can never you can never top that. You can never go anywhere else. I know. Um, I couldn't imagine leaving New York. Right. And I felt the same way. And you know, when like uh I've been there for six years and then when I when I got married, moved out to New Jersey and I was like, No, I can't do it. I can't leave. <laughs> but once I I was like, okay, now I get it. Now, yeah, it, it's so space. But yeah, having how are you finding uh, the like how how different is the experience now that you have some space up there? Um, so my husband had the had a really like good plan in terms of transition. We'd both been in New York for so long. I've been there almost twelve years, and he's been there almost twenty. Mm -hmm. So we decided that instead of just going straight to suburbs, we're gonna do like a smaller downtown kind of thing. So we're in Stanford and it's not too big of a change, but it's been so nice. It, mm -hmm. There's so much space and greens, our dog loves it. And in the beginning, like when we moved into the new apartment, like the, there was so much space, it felt simple. I was like. <laughs> I remember the first night we moved into this apartment and it's not big it's by any stretch it's like 1500 square feet and but compared to new york compared to new york yeah it's huge and i remember yeah. like sitting in the bedroom and there was trees outside and i was like i can hear the birds and something's not right because it's really really cool. yeah it's so i know so on the sirens and all that energy i know so how have you how has it impacted you creatively have you found that you're feeling more or less uh inspired um, I don't think it's really impacted my work it because also like if I want to go to museums and shows and stuff, it's only a 50 minute train ride. So that's okay. And also I have all these projects lined up. So it's not like I'd be short on ideas or whatever. Um, on the other hand, my studio is so much bigger. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's just like, it's just like a room, like it's just a normal room, but compared to New York, it's like, wow, you know, and I don't have to hang all the canvases on the wall to save space. Right. Now I have like piles and piles of it. So wonderful. 
So how has the uh, COVID been affecting you, the quarantine? Have you found that you've been able to, you know, spend some time in the studio or are you feeling just maybe not so inspired? I think is there's a, a mixed response that I've gotten from folks during these sessions. There was definitely sort of a, like a low period when um, it was like halfway in. At first, you know, everybody is like trying to stay positive and really for me, in terms of like work schedule, it's not that different. Um, and I feel bad for saying this, but I actually got more commissions because, you know, people are like at home, they're planning, they have more time to do personal stuff and they're like planning the, all this stuff. Um, but there was a period when you just like wake up, you don't know what's happening and you're just kind of like flat. Um, but on the other hand, my husband is here and like he's working from home. He's been working from home and our dog is super happy. I think our cat is a little annoyed that we're always here. <laughs> <laughs> we were, we had a little, uh, animal live, well, pre live session this morning. Uh, Annie's dog yeah. and my dog kind of joined our little, our little warm up session. So we had that, we had the little menagerie of, uh, animals with us. <laughs> And it's okay. nap time for the cat. It's nap time for everybody right now. So that's great. <laughs> so you have a very interesting journey to getting to become a full-time artist. You were previously mm -hmm. uh, a political analyst. Just tell yeah. us a little bit about the, you know, your pathway through grad school to take on this, you know, very serious, very analytical uh, position and how that journey transpired to take you into the creative industry? Um, so I, I went to school for political economy and international affairs, um, right in New York at Columbia. And um, it was, it was sort of towards like the middle of grad school, when I just started not being able to finish my papers. So I would start painting. I always sort of painted, but um, during this time, oh no, um, during this time, that was the cat. She was like, meow. <laughs> she doesn't like what you're saying. Like, <laughs> it's the cat and the dog. Um, yeah, so I started painting more um, kind of to like help me finish papers. So I would get stuck doing the papers and then I would paint and then I would get stuck doing the papers and then I would paint. And then um, I started painting portraits for friends um, and somebody was like, you should totally charge for this. Uh, and then after, after grad school, I started, um, I, I went into uh, to be a political analyst and I was, painting more and more and it was like every bit of time that I had. I was painting or learning about techniques or art. I was just thinking about it all the time. And then um, eventually I'm like, if your hobby, if you're spending more time with your hobbies and with your job, maybe I got to reconsider things. Hmm. It's interesting that you said when you were feeling stuck that you went to art. What, yeah. is, what does art give you emotionally that perhaps something, you know, some people would maybe go for a run or you know, meditate. What is it about art that bring, was able, enabled you to, to bring yourself out of those moments? I think it's almost like it helps you breathe. Mm. Like, Like it's, I mean, it's an outlet, but I think it's so much more than that at the time. Um, and now it's like, if I don't paint for a few days, you get like, you yearn. I mean, I think that's the best word for it. It's like, it's like, like something is missing. Like I might start overeating or, or, you know, start kind of like getting more down um, because it's just like, I need it. <laughs> right. I can relate. I get very antsy. It took me a, a while to realize that the connection to what that feeling was and mm -hmm. what, what, I, what the action would be to remedy that was to just go 
get in the studio and create something. Yeah. So I can, I can totally relate to that. Do you think there are parallels between um, your creativity uh, artistically and musically? Do you feel there's some synergy there? Um, I do actually, I do. I actually just saw now the, um, I started doing more painting after I stopped competing um, hmm. with piano. I actually just realized that. And with piano, there's, you know, like, when, I don't know, that used to sort of help me breathe. It was like, like, finally, you're like, breathing and flowing. And I guess that translated into painting. Hmm. So maybe that maybe painting sort of like replaced music and now it's like it's become so much more and i think as creative people so many of us are so so many people out there are multifaceted creators like there's so many musicians yeah. also artists and actors you know there's a lot of folks that are what would we call them the, the triple triple threats yeah <laughs> So it definitely translates to you know that yearning to wanting to just be expressive to express something yeah creatively mm -hmm. that's so, when you really feel free and it's almost like a high yep. yeah so the best natural high in the world <laughs> so how would yeah. you, how would you describe your work to somebody who perhaps hasn't seen it before um i would say I'm a contemporary realist slash surrealist. Um, I do a lot of portraits. Um, those are mainly commissions. And then I do my own series. And they're mostly uh, people focused because I just think it's so fascinating to be creating a face. There's just so much that goes into a face that, um, I mean, not only is it fascinating to see it come together, but also to question exactly what makes a face a face, right? Like you, when you're painting somebody, um, it's, it could, sometimes it's just one detail that changes from one face to like, you know, that makes one person go, oh, this looks like this person, or this feels like this person versus this doesn't. And it's like, what is it about some of these details, it just seems very magical to me. That's so why I did, like painting people and faces. So you were self-taught. So how did you discover that you had this, this talent? Was it something that came easily to you right away? Um, I took some like art classes as a kid, um, but not like, you know, not like super serious classes, just kind of like, you know, your mom takes you to uh, a drawing class or something. Um, and then I always kind of drew and painted. And then in grad school, it just kind of came out. Um, it was, I mean, there was a lot of stuff that I didn't know. And YouTube really helped with that. Books, DVDs. And I just found that I was so hungry um to know about how to paint how other people painted about this art world all these like artists in the past how they painted that i was just it was just insatiable and all of that helped just any bit of information i just wanted so much i'd never experienced that before um i was interested in you know like studying political science and international affairs, but nothing like this sort of like thirst and hunger. So you, you know, you go through these several years of education, you, you know, study international affairs, you go to an Ivy League school, you go to Columbia. Yeah, sorry, mom and dad for all the, <laughs> all the tuition. Well, is how was what was the response like when you said to to you know your loved ones? Okay, well, no, this is not for me. Like I I am yearning for a different path. How was it received? It's mixed. Um, you know, like like I mean, it's not like people were like, um, what a waste. <laughs> 
but it was more like, ah, and then, you know, why is that? Um, what are you going to do? How is this going to work out logistically, financially, that sort of thing. But, you know, a lot of people are really, really supportive too. Um, that's really, really helped just people believing in me and going, oh yeah, you can totally do it. People do this all the time. Like you're breaking free from something that doesn't suit you. So I think it's amazing. I think it's brave. And look, there's nobody can ever take away your Ivy League education, right? That's not going anywhere. So <laughs> it's not like you lose the time that you've invested. It's still a part of your journey. Yeah, I think so. And also all the, I think all the information that I've required or I've acquired through education um, and also like the ways that I've learned to think about things, all of that really adds dimension to my art. Um, I mean, everything, right? All kind of contributes can you expand to on what them? i am today can you expand um, on like the critical thinking aspect of it like how you approach your work perhaps a little differently than somebody else might um i think i mean i i don't really i mean there there are a few causes uh that my paintings sort of like revolve around and one of them is mental health um, and a lot of that comes from personal experience, family experience, um, you know, the knowledge that I've gained in school. Um, so that's really helped. And the way that I think about it, like, um, kind of like the metaphysics of some of the things, you know, like even when it pertains to color, like what is color? It's, anybody's perception how do i know what i see as red is what you see as red what is um like how does this like philosophy of language work in terms of perception and just from there can come a bunch of ideas that could be really interesting um i'm currently sort of finishing up the series on um what i called the beijing opera girls and i mean that's not the official name, I still have to think of one, but it kind of explores um, this issue of like women's rights and cross-dressing and gender. And so with, I should probably explain a little bit about Beijing Opera. So it, I got really interested and then sort of more obsessed with it um, because so before the 1900s, for like the last 5,000 years in China, there was uh, Beijing Opera. And it's, you know, it's got a very distinct sound, costumes, uh, roles, storylines. And until the nine, 1900s, it was only men that could perform because it was improper uh, for women. It was even considered improper for women to watch. So, I know. So until 1900s, um, like there was, it was just men doing both roles of men and women of all kinds of characters, all kinds of personalities. Um, and, uh, and after 19, let's say like 1900, probably around there, they started allowing women and then in the 1930s, uh, there started uh, to be groups, or I mean troops, that are all women. So mm -hmm. now you've got a mixed sort of uh, cast playing both, both, playing both men and women. And then later on, you have women playing men and wow. women. And I think it's just really interesting to think about this in terms of like how it kind of transcends gender and biology and it challenges this belief that 
um, you know, from the old Beijing opera days that only effeminate men can be successful at women roles and vice versa. And just the sort of like pluralistic view that is, you know, that exists in Beijing opera and how that is, how that kind of interacts with a more like dualistic society um, when it comes to gender. And now we kind of think about what is gender? What makes a female the female ideal? What makes the male ideal? How do we, how do we, or how do the actors play that? What makes it convincing? You know, all of these things. That's and then on top of that, there's um, the colors, um, what I call like the Chinese color palette. It's just very distinctive. And that's really interesting to explore because what makes uh, something so distinctly, distinctively Chinese looking, right? Like when you see, when you see a certain color palette, when you see a certain piece of fabric, you're just like, oh, that's Chinese. Or, you know, or like with the woodcuts, um, the Japanese woodcuts and the Nihonga um, paintings, like you see the colors and you're like, oh, that's Japanese. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what is it that makes that? Because all the colors are used, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I think I'm so obsessed with Beijing opera. And I think my education kind of opened me to see, to question some of the stuff. So you were born- Sorry, that was a super long answer. Enthralled, I, I, could, I think it's a, a brilliant conversation um, you know, around the, the, the ideals of gender and what we, what we interpret gender to be. And it's, you know, it's a very prevalent conversation right now. Um, so I'm intrigued. So you did, you did grow up in China. You were, so you were born in China and you went to boarding school. Um, were you able to ever attend the Beijing opera? Was it something that you experienced? Yeah. What yeah, absolutely. How did, how um, did so I don't actually remember much of, um, being a child attending and I certainly didn't appreciate all of this. Um, until later on, my dad lives in Beijing. So I go back, um, all the time and I started getting more into the cultural stuff because I think with, um, you know, with like people who grow up from the country of their ethnicity, they tend to have a certain kind of like fascination with it. You want to know more. Um, and and so I started doing more cultural stuff and this whole Beijing opera experience, it's so steeped in history. Um, and the actual like going to the opera is a whole affair because it comes with like this very traditional uh, Chinese tea service. They, um, you sit in round tables, which is like symbolic of this and that. And, um, and you learn about the different characters um and they have this teapot that has like i mean it doesn't even fit the camera but that that has a whatever the front of the teapot is called. but it's like usually it's like this big right but this is like two three feet long this is so that because the theater is so packed so the staff that's serving tea they would use these uh teapots with these incredibly long long uh, spouts and just be able to serve them, like, you know, with people five, six feet away. Wow. And it's quite something to watch. That sounds amazing. I want to go to Beijing now just to have that, that tea experience. <laughs> it's such a cool experience. So, you know, you've taken this incredibly rich culture and, you know, you, you're really interpreting uh, it into your work, not just through the colors and the, um, you know, the subject matter, but also through, you mentioned fabric. You've been incorporating some fabric elements into your work. Tell us how, how that uh, transpired and, you know, what, what you think that gives the work that perhaps you can't say with just paint alone. Mm -hmm. um, well, that came about, I think, primarily from, from feeling like something is missing. 
and I experimented with different textures and brush strokes, but it just still felt like something was missing. And I've always loved fabric and sewing. And so just like the folds, I love painting fabric. And then I started thinking, um, well, what, what it would be like if I'm painting fabric and at the same time having the different folds of fabric, creating like a texture that's even more, that adds even another dimension. Um, and then I started trying it and I just love it. And it, it suddenly was like, oh, okay. Like suddenly like that was enough. That was the thing that was missing. And it just felt right. So since deciding that you were going to become a full-time artist, how would you say that your process has evolved in that time? Ooh, it's evolved a lot. Um, how has it evolved? I guess it, it evolved with, um, I mean, experience definitely mm -hmm. makes it evolve, but also just learning more about the art world mm -hmm. and integrating um, kind of, I don't really know how to put this in words, but kind of like integrating the, like the feel, the spirit of where art is going and starting to kind of think about art in those ways. Mm. I don't know if that was clear. <laughs> You know, I was thinking as you were, as you were telling that beautiful story about the the Beijing Opera, like the art that I see reson resonate and impact, and the artists that I see do really really well have that deep deep connection to the subject, right? They can tell meaningful, mm -hmm. beautiful, expressive stories about why they create, and it seems mm -hmm. that you know you've connected those dots right out the gate. Like it's if you have that already. You know, you can only grow that. You can only expand from that. And I think that, that that's there's a, a lot of um, value in that deep connection to the work. Yeah, now, absolutely. So on that note, you do have this, you know, rich cultural uh, work that you create, you know, these, these beautiful characters. But you also have a very different series that runs alongside um, the yeah. series that's right above the piece in the background. So tell us the school of thought on these different uh, styles and you know how you perhaps balance these two different approaches to your work? Um, I don't really see it as sort of, I mean, they are very different subjects um, and they come to me, but I feel like they come to me in the same sort of way. I become interested in something, I learn about it, I, think about it and become obsessed with it. And then that becomes an idea for like a series of paintings that I want to do. Um, so behind me, you can see the, the Beijing Opera Girls. And then that one is actually a commission that still has to go out. I need to varnish it. Um, but so the three series that I'm struggling to find time to work on, they are very different. One is uh about borderline personality disorder one is about these gender issues with the beijing opera girls and another one is uh sort of like has to do with my obsession with words mm. um so that one is called untranslatable words and i'm starting with german because they have i mean german is known for all these like they just have a word for everything. Very, very abstract feeling that can be all just that can be encompassed in one word. Like when you're trying to explain an abstract feeling, usually you have to use like a whole sentence, but they have a word for it. It's can you, like, can you give us an example? Um, like, I think the most I, I think one that's uh, come into English um, that a lot of people know is schadenfreude which is the feeling that you get, the enjoyment of someone's suffering. 
um, which is awful, but it does happen. Like when you hear, uh, when you hear like an acquaintance uh, that you may or may not like, <laughs> that you may like, uh, break up with someone or like uh, got demoted, mm. you might feel a little bit of, you might enjoy that. And it is something that exists, but there's no word for that in English. <laughs> there's not even a word for that in Chinese. And, but there's a word in German for it. And then there's, uh, there's something that literally translates, it's called a uh, Kummerspeck. It literally translates to grease bacon. So that refers to the pounds, the weight that you gain specifically from after a breakup. It's like, there's just no words for that in English. It's like, oh, you know, oh, uh, like you look well. And you would be like, oh no, Kummerspeck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, and there's like another, um, there's another one that translates, I mean, I can't even pronounce this, there's like eight syllables in there, um, that literally translates to closing gate panic. So with that, <laughs> yeah, I know. And these are very like vivid, visual, yeah. like things, right? I so know. like grief, bacon, closing gate panic. So that describes the feeling of you, the realization, the feeling of panic um, when you realize that life is going by, you're getting older and the doors of opportunities, mm. um, you know, are closing and there's nothing that you can do about it. Wow. I mean, like there's a word for that. How crazy is that? <laughs> that is heavy. <laughs> right. Wow. And these are also vivid. Oh, there's another one that's really good. It's um, it's called staircase joke. It translates to staircase joke. So that is um, that refers to the thing that you think of right after uh, something's happened and you didn't think of the right thing mm -hmm. to say. Like if something happened and and it was like a perfect moment for a joke and you right. didn't think of it, but then right after or a few hours after you think of it that's the word to describe that funny so how do you and, have a connection to the german language um i don't this is <laughs> just like obsession with words and then i think this came from one of the articles that i read and then i just got so interested in it i started you know going down that road of being obsessed with it and reading more about it and this actually is there are other languages that have words that are completely untranslatable but are just so spectacularly random and abstract that i think german actually just has the most of these kinds of words but there's also in chinese and in japanese and all of these are incredibly vivid like they're just kind of begging for a visual representation so i'm gonna do like a whimsical kind of like visualization of these ideas okay. and then each painting is named after that word oh that's so fun <laughs> it's a good conversation because it, you know i had no ideas so it's just such a good subject to to share with your audience and really bring them into that that those particular pieces very yeah very i mean it was the coolest discovery when i read about it i was like oh my god they have a word for everything <laughs> I'm curious to know, one of our viewers, a good dear friend of ours, uh, Jan Phillips, is married to a wonderful German, uh, Hans Lehmann. Uh, so I'm curious to know if Hans has any uh, any input on this uh, or, or if we've missed any any special words that he might want to share with us. You know what? I'll send you a list. It's so cool. <laughs> That's amazing. But I would love to actually learn how to pronounce these mm. because they're like eight to ten syllables and there's no way i can pronounce them wow. without help do you speak uh any additional languages apart from the obvious ones um i do uh french but i think it's really like disintegrated and i i've forgotten like most of it i think i think if you're not using it it can it can leave very quickly right yeah I can probably a little lunch in french and that's about it but 
So you mentioned, uh, you know, you, some of your work is uh, focused on borderline personality disorder. Um, this has been something that's been very um, meaningful for you. Uh, you're working on a series called Emotions Matter. Can you tell us a little bit about what led you down that path and what, is, what has inspired this particular series? Um, so Emotions Matter is this group, this organization um, of advocacy, of support, um, for borderline personality disorder that I started volunteering for. And I mean, it's just such an amazing organization. They do art shows, they do uh, walks, fundraisers, and they do like all this uh, stuff to change policy um, on research for borderline and also um, how borderline treatments are funded by insurance policy. So they're changing like legislature and policy and at the same time providing this community for borderline people and at the same time advocating for, you know, awareness and everything. So I got involved with that. Um, and then like I started doing, I started going to the meetings and doing participating in their walks and fundraisers. And then I really became sort of more involved with it when they started planning an art show and reached out to me to help with that. Um, and I did a painting for it. And that started my sort of series on borderline personality. Um, it's very meaningful to me because the connection is personal. And I mean, it's, I feel like it's also one of these disorders that are very misunderstood and also not a lot of people know about because it uh, really only entered the DSM in like 1980s, 1990s. And the treatment for it is very, uh, it's very not definite compared to things like depression or schizophrenia. So it's really a system that helps you manage it because you never really are cured of it. So it's something that you live with. Um, it's just a matter of whether you are, uh, you know, like really having trouble with it or like in recovery. Hmm. So that makes it, I really do really know, close to my heart. I, I don't yeah. know anything about it. Can you tell us a little bit about how it, you know, or is it a high functioning disorder? Is it something that really folks struggle with? You know? Yeah. Um, so a lot of people actually, a lot of people respond that way. They don't really know what it is. And I think there's a lot of misinformation. Um, although it's really gotten so much better in the last like decade or so. Mm, it's, I guess it's characterized by really intense emotions. So imagine if you had no skin and you were living in the world, everything just feels incredibly painful or incredibly like whatever it is, incredibly hurtful or whatever. It just, everything is very, very intense. And um, people with borderline have trouble Sort of navigating through that. I think anybody would if they were naturally born that way and felt that way. So that in itself leads to um, things like self-harm and suicide. There's a huge high suicide rate for borderline personality disorder because, you know, like people who haven't received help with it, they're trying to manage it in whatever way that works. So you've got these sort of behaviors, self-destructive behaviors. Um, and at the same time, it co-concurs with, uh, co-occurs, co-occurs with other disorders like depression, anxiety, and even eating disorders and substance abuse because, you know, those are ways in which like people are reaching for some sort of like 
some sort of way to manage. Um, it's also characterized by this intense fear of abandonment, um, inability to be alone, very unstable moods, um, incredibly intense mood swings, um, and also this sort of like chronic feeling of emptiness. But I mean, which sounds like, I feel like a lot of people don't really understand because they think, oh yeah, everybody kind of experiences that. But what, what makes like a disorder a disorder is functionality. When you experience these things to the point that you can no longer function, that's what makes it a disorder. So like feelings of emptiness, yeah, like we all have that, right? But to the degree that people with uh, BPD have it, it's incredibly different. So that's BPD. That's, I mean, it sounds incredibly traumatic and painful to you know, suffer through that. But I think it's amazing that you're, you know, willing to bring light to this subject. And I think a lot of mental health challenges and also, you know, we've talked a lot about addiction on this show and um, depression, anxiety. It's very prevalent yeah. with, within our community. And I think for so yeah. long, seen as like taboo to even have these conversations but you know mm -hmm. I really appreciate you talking about it and, and shedding a little light and you know really educating uh, us on this particular topic uh so I mean, even two years ago I I wouldn't have been able to talk about it publicly mm -hmm. but um you know it's it's really this organization that's changed my mind and just to just knowing I mean, now finding out how much people don't know about it mm -hmm. and how much it is misunderstood. Wow. So the organization is called Emotions Matter, if anybody wants Emotions to Emotions Matter. Okay. Yeah. So they're on Facebook and then their website is emotionsmatter, I think, dot org. Wonderful. If not, then it's dot com. Great. Folks, do go check that out. And, you know, if you're inclined to support, please do. Uh, you know, we will definitely put a link in the comments uh, so folks can learn a little bit more about that. So let's switch gears a little bit because this story is beautiful. So tell me uh, what happened when you went out to St. Croix for a mural painting. Tell me about that experience. Oh, yes. That was the best trip ever. Um, <laughs> so a former client uh, reached out to me. And she said that her friend who lives in St. Croix, uh, her name is Glenda, uh, she started this project after the hurricane in 2016. So, um, so she started this project, which is to rebuild the city and make it an art destination. And that'll help with the economy, which was hit hard after the hurricane because it's primarily a, um, a, a travel destination. Mm -hmm. Um, so she, so this project sort of hires artists everywhere to paint walls in public spaces, whether it's like just a random wall or like a water tower or, um, one of those, I don't know what they're called, but like one of these boxes at the end of the road that has all the wires and stuff in it. Like an electric box? I guess so, but like huge. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so she hired me, um, and I was like, I've never painted a mural before. And she was like, that's fine. It's just like oil painting. And then I was thinking, oh, the paint is different. I don't even have brushes that big. How am I going to paint a wall? Right. But, uh, she and I talked and like, she answered all my questions and we worked out, we problem solved all of that. Um, I guess it's not really problem solving with her because she's been doing this and she has all the material and she's like, there are other artists who have never painted murals and it's totally fine. So um, then we went into designing it. So I actually did an oil painting uh, and she had to submit it to committees which were funding this project. And after it was approved, we started making uh, plans you know logistics to travel there um when i was there i actually only had five or six days to complete it um what was it like working under that kind of pressure it was 
stressful, but also exhilarating because I mean, I, I kind of feel like I get like a high from deadlines. <laughs> like I kind of thrive under pressure, I think, and it's really exciting to me. So now I'm thinking, you know, like all the planning and I draw out how much I would do and which part I would work on. What would happen if say the primer wasn't enough or like the paint was seeping through. Um, and I thought that that was like really good planning and, you know, I should be fine. But then there were all these other factors that we didn't think of. Like it was super hot. Um, the first day I thought I was going to pass out like in the sun in like 90 degrees. Um, so from there on, like I quickly implemented other like things that I got to, so like each day is kind of like, uh, like a version of the, like Apple's operating system. You know, they have each version of you, you do one day and then you like, think about it, make a list of bug report, like a bug report of all the things that gotta be problem solved. And then you try a new method next day. So eventually I figured out that I had to eat every two hours. I actually set a timer to drink water. Wow. Um, that was huge because it really helped with being able to paint consistently. Yeah. Um, the biggest hurdle was the weather which I didn't understand was a thing um, in St. Croix. Um, apparently, even the best, the most accurate weather app can't be accurate enough because mm -hmm. the weather is so uh, fickle. It just changes all the time. So you could be waking up to like a sunny day and then in an hour, it would look like it was gonna have thunderstorms all day. And then like in another hour, it's sunny again and it just goes like it just goes like that all day wow. and nobody can predict it so the woman who runs the program she's lived there for quite a few years and she will be standing there going see that cloud way over there it's gonna rain 35 minutes <laughs> and you know I'm like really really because it, it looks like it's not gonna rain right. and then she will be completely right so when it rains we have to cover up the whole wall because <laughs> water and oil. And this is something that like, I would have never thought about. I mean, it's like an island and it's sunny most of the time, but then you would get these spurts of thunderstorms, just like things like that. It was so exciting. It must have been a real challenge to take something that you used to work in on a relatively, by comparison, a relatively small scale to you know take it and really just enlarge it to this this mural level piece was it um what were the challenges apart from the weather and how did you feel once that was completed was it a sense of accomplishment oh yeah definitely um i would say like, the biggest challenge was how much of a workout it was i had no idea climbing <laughs> up and down the ladder um and you know like if you're painting on a canvas, you can step back all the time and it wouldn't be too strenuous. But with this, you're like climbing up the ladder, coming down and then backing away. And then eventually um, I started asking Glenda to just take a picture and show me so that I wouldn't have to go up, come down. And then also mixing paint was kind of such a pain mm. because it's so messy. Um, and like you're doing in such large quantity and you have a lot less control over, um, over sort of like how, over how you're mixing it. Like there's only so many colors, right? With paint and there's the viscosity is different the there's no transparency in like house paint in you know the way that we would have it like in oil for instance and then there's not really any difference in cold colors warm colors and that really affects how you're mixing your colors um just like stuff like that but 
I feel like just through trial and error, luckily, it didn't cause too much of a problem. But when I first realized that, it was actually a huge panic. Um, I think so much of the creative process, we were like crazy little mad scientists trying to experiment with what works and what doesn't. <laughs> yeah, but it's also really fun to problem solve, I think. It's like yeah. you're doing experiments, right? Yep. So something really fun happened on that trip in, the, in addition to the, to the uh, mural. Tell us, tell us about uh, that. Yeah. Um, so my boyfriend at the time, who is now my husband, flew out and surprised proposed to me, um, like right on the beach, literally at the moment of sunset. So the weather doesn't, uh, the weather apps don't work that well, but the sunset time works really well. So he was like right on the dot. Um, I had no idea. And I was just like, -ba -do -ba -do. this was the week after the, the wall. And I was just like, so happy. And He's joining me and we're just like having fun. You know, the fun that you have after having like made a deadline is like the mm -hmm. best feeling ever. And the whole day we were just like scuba diving. I'm like looking for cool rocks and collecting them. And then I'm like, oh, I want to have a nap and it's four. And the whole time he's freaking out. He's like, what if she doesn't wake up before the thing? Da -da 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 -da. Like, what if the arrangement is different? What if the sun starts setting early? And then, but it went perfectly. But he was like a nervous wreck. Oh, that's beautiful. I know. That is beautiful. All right, folks. So we are going to take some questions for Annie. So if anybody has anything, there's so much to unpack here. So thank you for sharing so much amazing, wonderful, beautiful stories. Uh, but if this anybody has really fun. questions, please do jump in. And we are going to take some questions for Annie. Uh, so I guess... I'm intrigued to know, um, I've obviously seen your, your work at shows, I've seen you, you know, uh, exhibiting. How does that feel as a creative to stand there in front of your work and, you know, take people's feedback and um, like, how do you feel in that moment? Um, it's definitely nerve wracking and it's hard not to take it personally. And of course, like, we're all humans, right? Like even if rationally you understand that somebody has a different taste or somebody won't connect with a certain idea, you still like that emotion still comes where you kind of feel like, oh, you know, and it kind of hurts. But then I feel like the more you do it, the more people that you talk to, you kind of look at it more as a process of, um, it's almost like getting feedback, but in, a non-emotional way. Mm -hmm. And I started to think of it like, you know, like the anytime you have like more than one brain, I kind of feel like it's really valuable to me. I can only think of so much, right, about this um, painting or or this color or, or this project, but somebody yeah. else might come along and give me like another perspective. And that's really interesting and helpful. So if I look at it that way, then it's actually really thrilling to have all these opinions and these different angles and perspectives. Um, and that helps with not taking it personally. <laughs> it's hard though, right? Because it is such a vulnerable thing to put your art out there on display. As the, yeah. what, what has been kind of the some of the most surprising feedback that you've had? Has there been anything that's really kind of taken you aback a little? Um, I think probably the people who don't say anything and just say, like, like or or just have a face, like, you hmm. know, <laughs> or like or whatever, you know, like they don't get it and then they don't say anything. And then it will be like, hi, thanks for coming by. And they're just like, and they walk by and it's kind of, that's hard to deal with. Um, or I think that's just the hardest part, but yeah. I don't really think, I think anything else, whenever you, someone is willing to communicate with you, then it becomes easier whether or not your perspectives 
you know, are the same or completely opposite. But it's when people just kind of go, mm, you know, and then they don't want to know more and they don't want to communicate about it. But you're just kind of like, ooh, I don't know what to do. You know, it's funny because I was just having a conversation with, with Jen last night about um, I recently made a sale and, you know, the communication with a client was, was great. And then there was something that was said that was that the client probably has no idea how impactful it was and not in a good mm. way. Um, it was kind of, it, it, it was something that was said that if it related to a product, you wouldn't even think twice about it, right? Mm -hmm. But because it was art, it really was like, it made me question everything about the piece. It made me, made me question mm -hmm. my own, uh, work. It made me question whether it was good enough. Yeah. And I think that because it is such a part of our soul, what we put onto the canvas or put onto paper, mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily Absolutely. think that the audience always understands that. And so yeah. they, they have this free range to be critical, to be yeah. um, negative about a piece of work. Mm -hmm. and that not really understanding how how much of a burden that can be for the for the creative who actually put yeah. their soul and their time and energy into that piece it's like you're standing there naked that's how i feel you're just yep. like standing there naked with your heart out on your hand and oh and say it, Love it's me. like no ragging <laughs> <laughs> not even that it's like because i feel like a lot of um a lot of non-artists, they would look at art and be like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Mm -hmm. Or they'll be like, oh, you know, like, I have a friend who does that. Like, this is not not anything, you know, to be, to, to like, really, you know, be worthy to, like, look at or whatever. And it's like, I feel like those people don't understand um, that there's a deeper, I guess, significance to it. Like, I mean, usually when I make something, like for instance, the Beijing Opera Girls, I'm not just drawing, I'm not just painting the girls. It has, it explores issues. It explores, it has a significance in terms of like, whether it is like philosophically questioning things like what is gender? What is this ideal? Like, can you tell that this is a woman or a man? And what does that mean? Like, it's the concept that we are making into visual, a, a visual representation. It's an idea that, that it, it's not just a picture. And that's what's so interesting about art is that you are making a physical thing that represents an idea. And that is something that I feel like a lot of people don't get. And instead of having, like reading the artist statement to see what all of this is about, whether it makes sense, and maybe like think about the questions it raises, um, they just kind of look at it and go away. And they're like, that's too red, or I can do that, my kid can do that. And it's like, oh, you're missing the best part about it. Mm -hmm. Yep. I always, if anybody that's ever said that to me or to another artist or about another artist, my response is, but did you? Did oh, you? <laughs> yeah. You know, and did you write that artist statement explaining right. that idea? Right. right. Yeah. There's some, especially when it's, you know, you talk about like conceptual. A really good one. Like, you know, people are like, well, I could do that. But it's the idea, it's the idea behind it. It's the the thought process it's what it, it's the messaging it's what the artist is is trying to deliver yeah so we do have one question here from emma good morning um uh, Hi, do, emma. do you have any artists who have directly inspired your creative choices and style good question emma. Ooh. oh my gosh so many um dead and alive mm. uh so of course the the surrealist Magritte, um, Dali, huge fan. Um, and then 
I guess a lot of the portrait artists too, whether they're realists or contemporary realists, um, just the way the seeing the way that other people, other artists kind of interpret faces, interpret this like, like nature of, I guess, the nature of humans as reflected through their expressions. That's really interesting. So Sergeant um, Balthus, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on this. Um, let's see, some of the contemporary ones, uh, David Kassan, mm. um, Ania Hobson, she's a really interesting one. Uh, Sharon Sprung. Mm. Um, I also feel really thankful to her because she was one of the first DVDs that I was able to buy and I learned a lot. And it was like, it was, it was like the best find, you know, I'd be like finding all these YouTube videos and little bits and books. And like, here's this woman who is like showing me how to paint. And I'm just like, oh, knowledge. Wow. That's amazing. All right, folks. Well, Annie, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for this beautiful, open conversation. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks. I had a lot of fun. All right. So how can folks learn more about you and your work? What is your website address? Uh, AnnieBowArt.com. And Bow is B-A-O. Um, and I have a Facebook page. It's also Annie Bow Art. And my Instagram is Annie X Bow. Um, but the name is Annie Bow Art. It's, my username is Annie X Bow. But if you just search Annie Bow Art, it'll come up. Wonderful. And the Emotions Matter, is there a website for them that we can put in here? I think it's emotionsmatter.org. Um, but you can also check out their Facebook page. It's just Emotions Matter. If you just type in that, you'll see it. Perfect. All right. Any parting thoughts for our audience, Annie? Um, you know, keep up keep, or keep going with your with your art. Don't give up. Um, have fun with it, you know? Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning thank in. Thank you, That's Rachel. For the day, uh, for today. And we will be back again, same time on Monday of next week. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful weekend.